All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you at Sergi this uh, afternoon. I am Jan Schweiner. I am the uh, founding person here, and I am here a lot, so I'm glad to be here with you today. And uh, it's a truly special occasion for us. Uh, we have uh, uh, an exquisite uh, speaker, Professor Philippe Bacchetta Bacchetta, whom you many know, is a uh, Swiss finance professor at uh, the University of Lausanne. He's a specialist in finance and macroeconomics. He's chairman of the economics department. He's the program director of the international macroeconomics and finance program at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR, which is based in London. He uh, received his PhD and master's degree from Harvard University, and before that he got his uh, first degrees uh, in economics from the University of Lausanne, to which he returned. But in the meantime, he taught at a number of uh, prestigious uh, universities in Europe, in the United States. Uh, he also uh, led uh, the uh, uh, study center Gergense, which is a Swiss national bank institution, very prestigious in Switzerland. So he will be our main speaker today, talking about the exchange rate as monetary policy instrument. The uh, event is sponsored by a number of institutions. I would like to welcome the Swiss ambassador, Mr. Antonietti. We've already done uh, uh, events before, and it's a pleasure to actually have a series of events that we, that we do together. Uh, on the uh, side here, the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic is the principal mover and shaker behind our uh, Institute for Democracy and Economic Analysis uh, Academy, Strategy of Academy uh, 21, which is a major project uh, in the Czech Republic, and we're very pleased to be uh, part of it. As you know, the idea, the Institute for Democracy and Economic Analysis, is a think tank within Sergi, which itself is a very successful joint institution between uh, Charles University and the Academy of Sciences, uh, and brings together uh, academics and students from all over the world nowadays. Uh, so, uh, just in terms of the logistics, uh, we will have the uh, main lecture, then we will have a very short five-minute uh, break, uh, and then we will have a very interesting panel where we have two really uh, stellar panelists. Uh, we will have uh, Dr. Tomáš Holub, who is director of the monetary department of the Czech National Bank, and he studied here as well as overseas. He spent time at uh, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and also London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, so he will be commenting uh, from the perspective of the central bank. And the second one will be Jaromir Hurnik, who is uh, a PhD also, who um, uh, studied here in Prague, but also has uh, spent a lot of time in, around the world, including Africa, and is based as a senior partner at OG uh, Research here. And I will add a few words as a panelist uh, after that as well. And as part of the second part of the program, you will all have a chance to ask questions and uh, get answers to everything you've always wanted to know about the exchange rate as a monetary policy instrument. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, pass uh, the floor to the Swiss ambassador. And let me just say one thing on a personal note. I uh, would like to thank Switzerland through you again. Uh, when I was 17 and had to go into exile, I uh, actually went uh, to Switzerland where I received political asylum and it was the Swiss hospitality which was very important for me at the time and my parents, my sister. And uh, I later went to study in the United States so I actually uh, left Switzerland but it's always a pleasure to be back. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I uh, thank you all of you for coming here. And Sergei, as um, you already heard, um, uh, it is not the first event which we organize together with uh, the Institute. We are very pleased to be able to do that. And uh, today um, uh, we will have a lecture on a theme which is, uh, to a certain extent, similar to both of our countries. So uh, what is it? Um, as you know, uh, Switzerland, we had since the year 2011 a kind of a fixed exchange rate, the Swiss francs towards the euro. 
For us, that uh, was and is something very important, as uh, we do have uh, an enormous trade with our neighbours. For instance, if you see Germany with Baden-Württemberg alone, Switzerland has more trade than with China or the United States. Or for me, being from the Ticino, I can tell you that with Italy, we are doing a lot more trade than we do with China or India or the United States. Or also to tell you here, as we are uh, in the Czech Republic, that our cumulative trade, we are doing Switzerland, Czech Republic, is bigger than the exchange we have with Brazil, uh, or the trade we have with Brazil, or we have with um, India or with Korea. So that shows you that for us it is very important that we do have a, a certain exchange rate to be compatible and to deal with um, uh, our uh, neighbours uh, for trade. So, um, uh, since two, uh, 2011 we had this rate, but then in January 2015 the Swiss National Bank has abandoned the fixed exchange rate, which was um, usually or quite most of the time, 1 to 120. So, of course, we had immediately, or I say of course, it was maybe to expect, Professor Baquetta, can you tell more on that later, that the Swiss francs was uh, re-evaluating. But when we, look, when we look now back to it, it seems that it was less the Swiss francs getting stronger, it was rather the euro getting weaker. Then, uh, in relation to other currencies, the Swiss francs even got a little bit stronger uh, or, or stayed a little bit weaker. But in relation to the euro, it was a, a very um, a big consequence. And some of the sectors of our economy, they paid a certain price, or for them, it was more, uh, uh, let's say, it hurt them more than other sectors especially um, machine industry or tourism, and um, it was not something where you can say it is winner or it is loser. It was for us uh, something, an equilibrium, because on the other hand, Switzerland, we are not able to be the lender of the last resort for a currency of a whole continent. And in the vaults of the Swiss National Bank, in the end, we had more than 523 billion of um, euros, and I mean, it was a situation which was extremely difficult to handle and which was not easy to find a compromise. So, before I give uh, the word to Mr. Baquetta, you, you did then the same. The uh, Czech National Bank is working in good um, uh, cooperation with the Swiss National Bank. Uh, Mr. Singer was always in close contact, even his successor now, and um, uh, the Czech National Bank did something similar. They did something similar, and uh, Mr. Singer, he said, he said once that he would be on the shoulders of our Swiss National Bank and doing the same. And I think for you it was a little bit less risky to do that, and even when you stopped with it, um, uh, if you allow me to say so, for you there is not a risk that the Czech crown would be a kind of uh, currency where people would go in with certain crises or, or uh, with certain problems which has advantages and disadvantages, but of course for you, I mean the shock waves are different and the reactions are different. But as I told you, I will not tell uh, now too much about that. We will have a uh, highly expert uh, on that, and I would like once more to thank all of you to be here. And uh, without further ado, Professor, la parole est à vous. Okay, merci. Um, hello, so I'm happy to be here. I, I will stand because I have to speak during 45 minutes, and uh, maybe uh, uh, it's uh, after lunchtime, and uh, maybe uh, you, uh, you may go into a nap. So if I, if I, I move, uh, uh, that uh, will be keep you maybe a, a week a little bit uh, longer. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and to talk about uh, uh, an exciting uh, topic, a topic uh, uh, I like a lot, which is exchange rate uh, uh, management, so should I, I, and, uh, and about, and about uh, uh, Switzerland. Uh, so it, for my talk, I will basically uh, talk about two, there will be two aspects in, in my talk. Uh, first, uh, I want to uh, give an overview uh, about uh, exchange rate policy, and then uh, I will talk about Switzerland. 
So uh, our ambassador has already uh, described what happened uh, in Switzerland, uh, but I will uh, go into some more details. And for the, the first part regarding the uh, exchange rate policy, um, I will try to be, uh, to be relatively brief. I could uh, speak about that for, for hours, but they told me, well, I have a limit of time, and also they told me not to be too technical. Uh, so this would be more, more of, a, of an overview. Okay. So, the, uh, when you talk about exchange, so the topic is about exchange rate policy, but exchange rate policy means what kind of exchange rate regime uh, do you uh, adopt? Mm -hmm. So, the exchange rate regime, we'll see, it can be fixed or flexible. Mm -hmm. Historically, countries have preferred fixed exchange rate uh, uh, regimes. Could be in the old times, the gold standard, Bretton Woods, uh, uh, and, and others. And here, let me show you a, a historical picture. So you see, this started in 1870 until uh, well, early 2000. Before World War I, uh, we had a proportion of countries using floating exchange rates. So this is the percentage of countries in the world adopting some exchange rate regime. Before World War I, there were many countries on the gold standard, increasingly, some on the silver standard, and floating was not so important. So it was mainly uh, fixed exchange rates. After World War I, in the interwar period, first you had lots of floating, uh, but uh, countries went back to the gold standard. So you see that the, gold, the, the yellow part uh, grows, so, so there was always this idea of going back to a fixed exchange rate. This was the, the, the objective. Uh, but, uh, well, things co uh, in the end collapsed. We had the, the Great uh, the Depression, and uh, countries had to give up the, the, the gold standard. Then after World War II, they uh, had this new system, uh, the Bretton Woods system, where countries tended to uh, be pegged to the dollar, uh, the main countries, but then other countries would peg to the UK or to France. So, so we have lots of, uh, lots of peg. Uh, and this is the Bretton Woods system. Uh, until uh, more recently, where we are more in the current situation, where you have the euro, some countries win the euro, but then many countries are, are floating. So there is always, for a country, there is always a choice. What, what kind of color do you want? Mm? And do you want to have a more fixed, more flexible rate with what currency? And this is an important uh, uh, policy, uh, policy choice, like you can choose your uh, uh, monetary policy, uh, fiscal policy, but exchange rate policy is, is a part of that. However, there is one thing that is important, and I'm going to uh, go back to that, is that when countries tend to adopt fixed exchange rates, this fixed exchange rate doesn't last. Most of the time, they uh, give it up. And there was a paper by uh, to uh, a famous international uh, macroeconomist, uh, Opsel and Rogoff. Uh, it was called the mirage of fixed exchange rates. Mm. So this is, people like fixed exchange rates. They stabilize uh, the currency, but uh, for some reasons, uh, uh, these fixed exchange rates, they typically don't last. We have many, so many episodes where uh, countries give up their uh, fixed exchange rate. Now, uh, Talking about the background, when we think about the fixed exchange rate, there's something that is probably well known uh, to, to those who know, know the topic, but something I need to, I need to mention, some, something called the impossible trinity, which uh, is something that you know, basically it means that you cannot have it all. all. And in terms of monetary policy, uh, there are uh, basically three uh, potential uh, uh, choices which is either you have free capital flow, uh, fixed exchange rate, or sovereign monetary policy. So you have these three elements, but actually you can only choose two out of the three. So it's impossible to have the three. It's not possible to have free capital flow, fixed exchange rate, and sovereign monetary policy. That's what is called impossible trinity. So you, you have to choose so either uh, A, B, or C. So you choose free capital flow with fixed exchange rate, or free capital flow with sovereign policy, or you can give up free capital flows, and then you can have uh, a fixed and sovereign uh, monetary policy. I will just focus on A and B. 
assuming that, well, you have a country that have a free capital flow, which is the case of, of Switzerland and I guess also of, of this country. So the question is, which one, A or B? You want to choose fixed exchange rate or your sovereign monetary policy. You cannot have, it, have both. And uh, that's where uh, the theory has been uh, trying to give uh, answers and also where empirical work has tried to uh, uh, study and, and try to give advice for which uh, uh, regime to, to choose. So the question is, no, do, you want, uh, to, uh, do you want stability of your exchange rate regime with a fixed exchange rate or do you want your sovereign monetary policy? So is it something, so this is, a, this is a difficult choice. Are you ready to give up your monetary policy? Now, one thing is that if you give up your monetary policy, maybe there are ways that you don't have to give it up completely. For example, if you are in a monetary union, France and Germany, they, they are in the same monetary union, but they don't fully give up their monetary policy because they can still say something at the European Central Bank. Instead, if uh, your country is, uh, is small and is pegging to the euro, or if Switzerland is pegging to the euro, uh, then it gives up completely its monetary policy because it has no say in the policy of the European Central Bank. So it's a, it makes a difference. So it's not just uh, uh, that you fix the exchange rate, bit, but how you fix it. There are different ways you can fix it. Moreover, the choice is not simply between fixed and flexible, but you have many intermediate solutions like uh, target bands, crawling peg, floor, uh, managed floating, etc. I will talk a little bit about that, but the, the discussion is mainly uh, to simplify between fixed and flexible, and that's what I will talk about in the next uh, few minutes. Now, the uh, analysis of uh, the exchange rate regime is very much related to early work by uh, Robert Mundell who uh, later on got the Nobel Prize uh, in economics. I think he came here, uh, I saw his picture somewhere in, in, in the hall, so uh, uh, maybe some of you have, uh, have uh, met him here. Uh, so Mandel developed a theory which is more related to uh, common uh, currency areas, like well, monetary unions, but still the analysis is valid for uh, the choice between a fixed or, or the flexible exchange rate. And what Mandel and later work uh, uh, showed is that it depends a lot on how open your country is. If you have a very open country, uh, you are more likely uh, to prefer a fixed uh, exchange rate, uh, according to, uh, to, to Mandel. And what matters in terms of openness is trade, uh, capital flows, and labor mobility. So if you have the three levels of mobility, uh, trade, capital flows, and, and, and labor, then it becomes more interesting to have a fixed exchange rate. And let me just uh, explain why um, in a couple of slides. If you have more trade, you are uh, more uh, affected by uh, similar, uh, similar shocks. So your economy is more likely to move uh, with, with the other economies, you are more likely to have correlated uh, business cycles. Mm. Uh, um, so in that case, uh, uh, you, you are less, um, I think uh, um, this is about the, the, the next slide. So you, you are more uh, correlated with the, with, the, with the other countries. But the, if you are more open to trade, uh, you are more sensitive to the exchange rate. So you, um, you care more about exchange rate fluctuations, so you care more about fixing the exchange rate. If you are uh, more open, uh, also investors are, have a, a stronger positions in foreign currency, so they can lose more if, you, if, they, if they invest abroad. So you are more sensitive to exchange rate movements. On the other hand, if you have more trade, you are again uh, more uh, correlated so your, your economies move closer to the other countries. So it's less important to have, to have your own monetary policy. So monetary policy independence becomes less important in that, in that logic. If you have more uh, uh, international portfolios, uh, you are more diversified. Uh, so investors are less affected 
um, by uh, development in, in, in different countries, so you, there is less need for stabilization. And finally, and very importantly, if you have labor mobility, workers are less affected by shocks in a given country, because if you have a big recession in a the country, they can move to another country, and therefore the need for stabilization and uh, for all monetary policy is, is less important. So with these various aspects of integration, uh, it is more valuable to have a fixed exchange rate, and it is uh, uh, less important to have one, one's own uh, monetary policy. Uh, therefore, uh, according to uh, Mondal's uh, analysis, uh, this criteria will uh, determine whether you prefer uh, fixed versus uh, flexible. So this is the, the early analysis. Again, Mondal started in, in the 60s. That's what we teach from the textbooks, uh, there are in, for the, at least the undergraduate uh, textbooks. Then, after uh, uh, Mandel, uh, there have been many other things that uh, were, were, were developed. And um, the, the, um, um, there, there are many, many other, other, other mm -hmm. factors. <clears throat> so maybe, um, I think I, I had changed my, my, my slides here. But, um, so the, um, an another factor, uh, let me start with the, with the, second, the second one here. Uh, part of the analysis has shown that it depends on the type of shocks. Uh, because if you uh, lose your monetary policy, then uh, uh, it's only uh, a problem if you have demand shocks. So uh, that's why with uh, flexi uh, flexible uh, exchange rates are more important if you have demand shocks because you can offset these demand shocks with your monetary policy. You can stabilize your, your economy. So if you have an economy with more demand shocks than other shocks, you would prefer a flexible rate. If you have monetary shocks, you prefer a fixed exchange rate. So it depends on the type of shocks. So this is one type of uh, analysis. You have lots of theoretical models about that. Another uh, second uh, uh, type of analysis is that a fixed exchange rate system may help you reduce inflation. So in countries that tend to have problems in reducing their inflation level, they often uh, uh, would like to fix the exchange rate to uh, import some discipline. So it is, at least it is, it is claimed that uh, at least for some countries they can stabilize the, the inflation rate uh, by, by having a fixed, uh, uh, a fixed ex exchange rate. So this is of course valid for those countries that have problems with inflation. Then a, a third point, now so I'm going back in, in order, uh, here um, the level of financial development also matters. Because if uh, you are uh, uh, well developed financially, you can uh, easily hedge shocks. You are less affected by, by shocks, by fluctuations, and by exchange rate fluctuations. So countries that are more developed financially are less affected by flexible rate and uh, may, may prefer a flexible rate. While countries that are less de uh, developed financially will prefer fixed rate because they really value uh, the stability. And there I've done uh, some, some research, and including empirical research, uh, with uh, uh, Philippe Aguillon and uh, Francier and Ken Rogoff, where we show that for countries that are less developed financially, they do better with a fixed exchange rate. And doing better means a better growth. So there are higher countries with low level of financial development and fixed exchange rate have a higher growth than those with low level of development with a flexible rate. So for countries with a lower level of development, uh, it's more uh, advisable to have a fixed rate. For countries that are more developed, what we found that the difference was not uh, statistically significant, so we couldn't tell much difference between countries with a fixed and a flexible, uh, em empirically. So the difference between fixed and flexible, we only found it for countries that were less developed uh, uh, financially. Another, another issue that 
is uh, discussed in the literature, maybe less theoretically, but more about uh, the interpretation of the exchange rate policy related to uh, the previous crisis. During the, uh, the great financial crisis, Great Depression, uh, several countries suffered, uh, Southern Europe, uh, Ireland, Iceland, Greece, and several people were saying, well, for example, Greece uh, could have done much better with a flexible exchange rate. But since Greece is in the euro, it cannot adjust well. And uh, uh, so therefore, if you have a large shock, uh, then uh, it may be desirable to, um, to have a more flexible exchange rate. But this uh, debate is not totally uh, uh, set because uh, initially people were saying, oh, look at uh, Iceland. They had a flexible exchange rate and they adapted very fast. So Iceland is a good example that it's better to have a flexible exchange rate. But now we have a, another example, which is Ireland, which also had a similar crisis and was in the euro. And it turns out that Ireland also recovered fast. And in terms of the recovery, uh, it's difficult to tell the difference between Ireland and Iceland, between a fixed exchange rate and a flexible rate. So having a flexible rate to uh, adapt to a, to a, to a shock uh, is, is a difficult. Uh, we, we don't fully know. Like Paul Krugman argued that flexible rate is really so much better, but uh, there, there's a debate. There's a debate about that. But it's a, it's a discussion, and people are analyzing this, whether it's a, a fixed or, or flexible. So maybe so that's about what I want to say for for my review of the of the theory. So as, as you say, it's, it's very very brief. Uh, so in, in the theory, we can identify conditions under which it is better to have a fixed or or a flexible. Uh, I, I showed I mentioned that for less Financially developed countries, we tend to prefer fixed, but for more developed countries, we are not totally sure. So there's no evidence which one, which one is, is, is better. Moreover, and maybe this is one of the explanations, is that conditions change over time. So for example, it's best to have a flexible exchange rate when you have demand shocks and fixed when you have monetary shocks. But these shocks, I mean, sometimes you have uh, more of one shock and another time more another shock. Uh, so uh, uh, it's not that you have the same condition uh, at a given point in time. So maybe at a given point in time, you would like to have a fixed exchange rate, and another point in time, you would like to have a, a flexible uh, exchange rate. So the conditions uh, change. And here, I have a, a small uh, an analogy. So uh, uh, for the, I'm not a fan of Formula One. It's not, uh, I don't, don't want to give the wrong impression, but uh, uh, still, uh, from time to time, uh, uh, there is a Formula One race on, uh, uh, on, on, on TV. And then imagine it's a cloudy day, hmm? and uh, maybe the rain is threatening. Would you like to have, uh, what kind of tires would you have on your Formula One? Do you want to have a dry weather? Tires or wet weather tires, like rain tires or, or dry weather tires. You, you need to make a choice. So, of course, if it rains, you know it rains, you will put uh, uh, the wet weather uh, tires. Uh, if, uh, uh, if it's dry, you have the dry weather uh, uh, tires. But then, at the beginning of the race, if it is threatening, you will have to take a decision. And maybe some, uh, for some cars, they will have one type of tires and the other car, another type of car uh, of tires, even though the cars are very similar, but still it's a, it's a strategic decision for the race. Now this analogy uh, may be not so, uh, so good in a sense because uh, in this Formula One uh, competition, the car, they stop and they can change the type of tires. So if suddenly, now if it's dry at the beginning and then it starts to rain, then they stop and they, they change the type of, of tire. So it's relatively easy. Although, well, here in the picture, it's not, well, you see, it's still, uh, still uh, it requires lots of, lots of energy and resources to change the, the type of, of tires. And maybe cha changing the uh, uh, exchange rate regime would be uh, more difficult. So here, the, the, the analogy, you know, is that uh, uh, you know that conditions may change, and you need to decide an exchange rate regime. You don't know if it will rain or not. You don't know the type of shocks you will face, and, and, uh, and you, may, you may change it, no? like, like the tires, but it may, it may be costly. Actually, changing the exchange rate regime is more difficult 
than changing the tires in a Formula One race. Actually, if you look at history, a period of fixed exchange rate regimes they typically end dramatically with uh, uh, speculative attacks, uh, uh, with uh, the central bank being forced to abandon the fixed exchange rate. Uh, now, you could, you could argue that in a period of low interest rates, as the one we've lived uh, before, uh, uh, it was a bit easier. Because if you want to support the fixed exchange rate, in that case, well, you can do it by expanding your uh, money supply. That is, you can do it by unsterilized monetary policy. And therefore, uh, uh, you can still uh, reach your, your macroeconomic goals while intervening in the foreign exchange market, uh, which is not the case uh, uh, in, in, uh, in normal times. So basically, in the recent period, in the period of liquidity trap, uh, you may argue, and I'm sure people in the, some people in this room will, will argue that uh, uh, it is uh, a good solution to change the tires and change the policy and go to a, uh, uh, an exchange rate policy because uh, of the special conditions where you, you, you can do this and have unsterilized intervention, which is a type of unconventional monetary policy. Still, still you have the issue of changing back to the flexible. And uh, uh, this is, uh, can still be complicated and maybe you, you may have to be forced to change it earlier than what you want. Uh, so there are, there are issues and, and uh, in, in, in Switzerland they were also uh, just problematic and I know also here uh, the, uh, in, in the Czech Republic from what I, I, I read. So people, some people are not totally happy about when you change the tires or the, the regime and, and how, how you do it. Uh, so that's uh, about, about uh, this, this analogy uh, about whether you can change a, a regime. No, it's not something you can, uh, so in my view, it's not something that you can easily do. In the recent period, maybe, but usually uh, it's much more difficult to change a, a regime. Uh, um, and uh, maybe uh, now I will uh, illustrate this by talking about the Swiss, uh, the Swiss experience. So, um, so am I, how am I doing in t with time? So is it? You're, you're doing fine. You can go for another minutes. Okay, because I didn't. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so let's talk about about uh, Switzerland. Uh, maybe I don't want to go all the way back to uh, uh, to the gold standard, but just the creation of the euro. So when the euro was created, there was an issue about exchange rate policy in uh, uh, in Switzerland, and uh, it turns out that. The uh, uh, euro Swiss franc exchange rate turned out to be very stable. If you look at this picture, when the euro was created, it was worth 1 franc 60. And the exchange rate moved around 160, well, 150, 160, so it's extremely stable. So people were very happy about that, in particular the central bank, like the governor was saying, you know, paying the Swiss franc to the euro is not realistic, it's not, just not interesting because uh, the euro is, is uh, well, the Swiss franc euro exchange rate is extremely stable. So having a flexi, so they were a flexible exchange rate, no foreign exchange intervention needed, and actually it was clearly declared that this is totally uh, useless. So the choice was a flexible exchange rate, and this was ideal, everything was perfect. Now, unfortunately came the uh, uh, financial crisis, and then the Swiss franc, which was so stable around 1.6, then so this rate just went down. Like you are going downhill the Swiss Alps from 2007, you just go down, 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 uh, until uh, almost, almost one, uh, even towards one. One day it went even below one. So conditions changed. So this idea of a stable exchange rate around 1.6, even initially, so it go to 1.5, 1.4. Uh, so now, uh, uh, well, the Swiss, the Swiss National Bank has to do something. So what you do in these cases, the first, you lower the interest rate. So that's what they do. They lower the interest rate. So this is the LIBOR, which was about 3% uh, before the crisis, and they decrease uh, close to zero. So then it makes the Swiss franc less attractive, and the, the currency should appreciate less. 
But then this was, this was not enough. The Swiss franc kept appreciating. So then the central bank starts to buy euros. So then the foreign currency reserves in 2008 was uh, something like uh, uh, 90 billion uh, uh, Swiss francs and starts to increase. So they intervene a lot. But these interventions, they didn't have much of an effect. The Swiss franc keeps appreciating. Plus, this was a very bad strategy financially because the Swiss National Bank was buying euros at 1.5 at a very high price. And all these euros bought at 1.5 now, they are worth about one, so like 50% loss on billions that have been bought. So this was a bad strategy. Uh, uh, the person in charge of the strategy was not an economist and, and was, was not listening to economists. He made a big, big mistake. In the end, he had to leave. Uh, uh, and, and this is related in part to these, um, to these, uh, uh, these purchases. So this was not enough. So in the end, uh, the, the, the Swiss National Bank didn't know what else to do. Uh, uh, so in the end, they decided to introduce this floor uh, uh, announcing that the Swiss franc or the euro could not go lower than 120. And this immediately stabilized the exchange rate, at least for a while. Then a few months later, there was again uh, problems with uh, Greece and the US and the debt problem. So again, we had speculation towards Switzerland. So again, large interventions. So in 2012, large interventions. But fortunately, 2013-14, things stabilized again. So 2013-14, this was kind of the golden age of this uh, exchange rate regime. Everybody was convinced this was a, a permanent solution because we had uh, no, no speculation, stable exchange rate, reserves were flat, uh, and we could go on for a long time. Uh, so everybody was planning on a, a stable exchange rate, didn't hedge, firms didn't need to hedge anymore because it was so stable and safe. But uh, towards the end of 2013 uh, or 14, uh, speculation started again. There were issues in Russia, there were other issues in the world, uh, and people started again to buy uh, Swiss francs. The Swiss National Bank had again to intervene, and reserves were uh, increasing, increasing again, and they were already pretty high. They were uh, uh, like maybe uh, 70, 80 percent of, of, uh, of the GDP. Uh, so markets were becoming nervous. Saying, oh, there's again another wave. Plus, the ECB decided to uh, have even more expansionary monetary policy, making the euro less attractive, and therefore the Swiss franc even more attractive. So faced with this, uh, this situation, uh, so we had the, the Swiss franc shock. Uh, there was also political pressure because of these reserves uh, increasing, so the Swiss franc was, uh, well, the floor was abandoned on January 15, and this was mostly unexpected. There were a few things in the press, maybe a week before, when the, actually, people started to get nervous about a week before when they published the reserves of December. That's when they, they, they got nervous, and, well, this kind of a accelerated uh, things. So that's uh, the, uh, the story of uh, the fixed exchange rate regime from uh, September 2011 to January 2015 in, in, in Switzerland. I'm sure that many people would have liked to keep going with this stable fixed exchange rate. This was very nice. But for some reason, the Swiss National Bank uh, decided that it couldn't uh, sustain this anymore. And then now we are back to a floating rate, uh, but with negative interest rates and foreign exchange intervention that continue. So here you see, again, euro Swiss franc, and you see that it was pretty flat until uh, January 15. Then there was this appreciation, and now uh, we are around uh, one, a, bit, a little bit below 110. Interest rates were also lowered. Now we have negative interest rates, minus uh, 0.75 for the LIBOR. Uh, it's difficult to go much lower. And then foreign reserves. So even now they've abandoned the fixed exchange rate, it doesn't mean that they stop intervening. See, the intervention, they keep going. 
on a steady path. It goes up and up and up. And if you look at the numbers here, what is interesting to notice is that, so there are many zeros, but the size of Swiss GDP is a bit below 700,000. So now we are above the size of Swiss GDP. So the reserves of the central bank are higher than 100% of GDP. It keeps going up. We don't know what the, what the end uh, uh, will be. No? So that's our, that's our current situation of flexible, so-called flexible exchange rate. Uh, at least it is not a fixed exchange rate system. So what are the lessons from this episode? And I'm sure we'll talk more about this during the panel, but just to kind of give some, uh, some, some comments. So the first, the floor was successful in stabilizing the exchange rate for some time. So it limited exchange rate fluctuations. Uh, it worked, the flow worked like the fixed exchange rate. It was also, it has also the feature that it was combined with unconventional monetary policy with the central bank expanding its balance sheet. Other countries, they buy uh, domestic assets, like the US, the ECB. Well, here, uh, uh, these countries, uh, Switzerland and uh, the Czech Republic, they increase the foreign assets. But basically, they increase their, their balance sheet. So these two elements seem to go together, together well. But still, it was not possible to keep the fixed exchange rate. Even though you keep buying foreign assets, it seems uh, uh, the fixed exchange rate was not sustainable. And that's uh, a, bit, uh, it was a bit frustrating. I say it ended up unpleasantly. Uh, well, it's difficult to describe. Some people were very upset. Uh, others didn't uh, worry so much. But this illustrates, again, the mirage of fixed exchange rates. So these fixed exchange rates are useful for a while. You don't know for how long. Uh, so it's not totally clear how useful th this can be. So maybe you can stabilize it for a while. But since you don't know how to, to exit, uh, you don't know how this will end. This may, this may end in a disaster or not. Actually, there's another episode of the Swiss monetary policy where they also had the floor, and then things suddenly get uh, better. And in the end, this floor was no longer binding, and the Swiss franc uh, uh, depreciated, and, and they never had the problem of exit. It was kind of a natural exit. So probably they were hoping that something similar would happen, but most of the time, that's not the way fixed exchange rate uh, uh, end. They end in... Well, with, with speculation, uh, or, or the, the central bank is forced to, to give it up uh, earlier. So there's a lot of uncertainty about how things will, will end. There is no exit strategy, because, well, for, probably for good reasons. So you are basically, you have a policy that you implement, that you, you don't, and, but you don't know completely how this can end. And there's some probability that this will end uh, in, in, a, in lots of speculation or, 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 or disaster. So you, you can ask the question, no, is it, so there's a trade-off. You stabilize for a while, but then you have problems later on. So is it uh, something useful to do? In a period of very low interest rate, this may make more sense because uh, uh, you want to expand your, uh, your, your assets. But if you are not in a period of low interest rates, I, would, I don't think that uh, this would be a, a wise uh, strategy because as you want to stabilize the exchange rate, you would need to have uh, uh, unsterilized intervention. Or if you have sterilized intervention, then you, you would uh, push inflation. So this would, not, this would not work. So maybe I think this is a topic that could be discussed probably during the, 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 the panel. The next um, uh, slide, and, and I have two, two more slides. Uh, so since this temporary uh, regime now has been given up, so what do we do now? What do you do now here? So uh, I mean, most many European countries that are not part of the Eurozone, they ask themselves the same question. So in Iceland, they have the same uh, debate. Or, uh, so do we uh, keep going with a flexible rate, or do we uh, adopt the euro? Hmm. Uh, so if you're within the European Union, it's easier because you can go into the eurozone. If you're outside, like Iceland or Switzerland, it's, a, it's a less uh, uh, pleasant because you are, you're outside of the, uh, the uh, eurozone, so it's maybe more, more difficult. So there's this question, fixed or flexible, and Switzerland is, is to ask the question, and many countries have, have to ask. In, in, 
In Switzerland, there is one major uh, argument, which is uh, Swiss interest rates, Swiss real interest rates tend to be lower because well, there's a preference for Swiss assets and uh, uh, this lowers, can lower interest rates. So if you have a flexible exchange rate, it's easier to benefit from these lower rates. And that's at least, that's an argument that, that's the main argument at least uh, from the, the central bank for why uh, we want to keep a, a flexible rate. But then the other more general argument is that with a flexible rate, you keep your sovereign independent monetary policy. So that's what people want to keep, flexible rate for the flexible independent monetary policy. But is this true? Because uh, uh, like Switzerland, doesn't have, uh, as we just saw, doesn't have independent monetary policy. Uh, it has a very low interest rate, is very dependent on what the ECB does. If the ECB starts to increase interest rates, well, Switzerland will increase interest rate. If they keep going with quantitative easing, Switzerland will keep going. So this independence of monetary policy is in the textbooks. This is part of the trilemma. This is part of all, most of the analysis, but in reality, uh, it doesn't seem to be so uh, present. And when you have full capital mobility, uh, there is a debate. Is there really uh, independence of monetary policy? Of course, for very small things, yes. But I think, well, I'm sure the Czech Republic has to follow the euro very closely. Uh, uh, and how much independence is there after all? So, there is, uh, so therefore, instead of a trilemma, uh, it's more about the dilemma. And this was uh, mentioned, for example, by Ellen Ray. Uh, so I, in the end, the exchange rate regime doesn't matter much. What matters is whether you have capital mobility or not. So you could have capital controls, and then you could, uh, you could choose. But once you allow for capital mobility, like Switzerland, they will not go back from capital mobility there. Maybe the exchange rate regime, after all, uh, doesn't change much. We have to follow a lot the, what the European Central Bank does. So this choice, a lot of, of theory, etc. but maybe in, in practice, uh, uh, this is a bit uh, disappointing, but uh, uh, the, there is less um, autonomy or flexibility that, that there is. So if you ask, well, what is the optimal exchange rate regime? Well, we, uh, there is no uh, miracle solution, no panacea. With f full capital mobility and financial development, also, it doesn't matter much in the end. Uh, it's still important to implement this well, because you can make mistakes, but maybe in the end, it doesn't matter so much, uh, and you have to take the solution that is best uh, politically. And to uh, conclude with my Formula One analogy, uh, uh, if you have uh, rain from time to time, you could uh, choose between uh, wet weather or dry weather, and maybe in the end of the, uh, the race, you, you get the same speed uh, because uh, one is better for, for one, one, the other one is better for the other, but in the end, it will, it will get you the, the same. It doesn't make much difference. Still, uh, if you want to uh, have your, your, your tires, you need specialists, you need to do it, to do it well, to have the, 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 good, the good tires, and then which one you choose may just depend on your, on your taste or on what you believe in, uh, really. So it's a difficult uh, choice. So I will uh, conclude here. So thank you, and we'll thank continue. Thank you, Philippe. So we will take a very short five-minute break, not more than that, and then we'll have the panelists here react, and you'll be able to ask questions. Thank you. The main message is that in fact, there are more differences than similarities between the two cases, in spite of the fact that at least for a casual outside observer, they looked similar in at least two key aspects. The, the first one was the design of the exchange rate floor, the fact that it was a publicly announced commitment of the central bank not to allow the exchange rate to appreciate uh, below a certain level, the chosen level was a nice round number that could be remembered easily and both the two central banks uh, promised uh, to intervene uh, in the FX market in un potentially unlimited volumes to 
back the, the exchange rate commitment with real actions in the market. So this was the ex ante similarity. There is also one ex post similarity and it's the actual duration uh, of the two floors in the number of uh, days, which uh, I'm not sure whether this is just a coincidence or a sign of this mirage of fixed exchange rates that you cannot live with it for more than uh, something more than 1,200 days. Uh, no, I think it's, it's rather a coincidence, but I think it's, it's nice mentioning. But otherwise, there are many differences. The reason why the policy was introduced was different. Uh, Switzerland was facing sharp pressure on appreciation uh, of the currency due to uh, safe haven inflows and I think the main concern was uh, competitiveness of the Swiss economy, also given the fact that uh, Swiss National Bank is not officially an inflation targeter. While in our case, uh, the exchange rate was actually slightly depreciating, also thanks to verbal interventions ahead of the introduction of the floor. So we were not facing the same kind of problem, but we were facing the problem of deflationary risk uh, or at least undershooting of our uh, official, official inflation target. Uh, and uh, we started to use uh, the uh, floor as an unconventional uh, monetary policy instrument within our inflation targeting regime. Of course, we, we were in a somewhat easier situation during the floor because uh, we didn't have to face these uh, safe haven inflows like uh, Switzerland did. And uh, at the same time, the Czech National Bank was not uh, internally or domestically facing any constraints on the size of uh, the balance sheet expansion, while in Switzerland this became a big political issue. And there are also many important differences about the exit from the exchange rate commitment. The Swiss National Bank had not been communicating about exit basically at all, and then it happened very surprisingly. It took uh, many people uh, unprepared, and there was a jump appreciation, which of course had a negative impact on the Swiss economy. I must admit that the impact was relatively small given the size of the appreciation. I believe that if a similar appreciation took place in the Czech Republic, the damage uh, would have been much bigger. Uh, in the Czech Republic, we had a rule-based uh, and uh, telegraphed exit. We talked about it well in advance. Everyone prepared for that. And, uh, after the exit, we are so far actually experiencing only a very moderate exchange rate appreciation. Uh, unlike the, the deflation which uh, followed the Swiss exit, we are actually returning to the inflation target from above and the domestic economy is likely to do uh, quite well according to our most recent forecast, which would allow us to start normalizing monetary policy while the Swiss National Bank is still cut with, uh, still, uh, still stuck with uh, negative uh, nominal interest rates and ongoing intervention. This is uh, the comparison as regards the exchange rate development. I think there is one more similarity here actually, that both the two floors uh, were uh, introduced very successfully from the operational point of view. Very quickly the central banks managed to move the exchange rate above the floor and uh, it took the market just a few days to realize that on this side of the market the central bank is actually playing in its home field and it cannot be e uh, beaten easily. And as a result there were then relatively long periods in which the credibility of the floor itself was enough to maintain it and the exchange rate was moving above the floor without uh, any need for actual FX interventions. But then of course there were periods in which the two floors came under pressure but for different reasons in the two cases. In the Swiss case it was mainly related to the external factors, the inflows associated with the safe haven status and the sovereign debt crisis in the euro area and its uh, various spikes over time 
While in the Czech Republic, I would say it was mainly domestic. It, the inflow or the pressure on the floor started once the market uh, started to sense the forthcoming exit from the exchange rate commitment and started to speculate on post-exit appreciation. The third slide with comparison, it relates to the size of the balance sheet of the central bank relative to the GDP. And you can see that both central banks experienced a different uh, increase uh, in the balance sheet or the timing was different. Uh, in the Swiss case, we more or less see a linear trend with some oscillations around the trend, but we cannot actually tell where the exit was, purely looking at the balance sheet size. So from that point of view, it was, uh, it was I would say, not a completely successful exit. In the Czech case, we had a milder increase and then a kind of exponential increase in the last uh, three months of uh, the exchange rate commitment, but hopefully that's it. Uh, of course, we cannot say for sure, uh, it's still a short period of time, but uh, the exchange rate uh, development after the exit has so far been so smooth that uh, the Czech National Bank uh, could stay out of the market and uh, the balance sheet size uh, relative to the GDP may now stabilize, perhaps apart from EU fund inflows which go directly into central bank reserves. So this was a brief comparison. Uh, now a closer look at the Czech case. Uh, one way to evaluate how successful the policy was is of course to look at what happened ex post compared to uh, what the central bank was expecting ex ante when the floor was uh, being introduced. And here on the right hand side you can see that the re recovery of the real economy was actually even somewhat faster than expected at that time. Mainly, of course, in 2015, uh, there were other factors uh, besides the monetary policy which contributed to that, but at least the, the real picture looks quite positive. As regards the nominal picture, uh, we actually stayed uh, at low inflation levels for much longer than uh, originally intended or envisaged, and uh, we uh, reached the inflation target or the upper half of the tolerance band around the target uh, roughly two and a half years later than originally expected. Another point of view is to assess how real monetary conditions developed, uh, looking both at its both components, the exchange rate component and the interest rate component. This is our estimate of real monetary conditions. A positive number means that we have easy monetary conditions which support the real economy. And you can see that before the floor was being introduced, we had roughly neutral monetary conditions because the interest rate component was loose, but uh, we assess the exchange rate as slightly overvalued in real terms. And of course, there would be a desire to move the overall index to positive levels, but given that the nominal interest rate was stuck at a zero lower bound, it was not possible to do uh, through the conventional instrument. But once we introduced the exchange rate floor, we had further relaxation of the interest rate components because of increased inflation expectations. And also the exchange rate moved from slightly uh, overvalued to slightly uh, undervalued. And we maintained easy conditions basically until the very exit. Uh, and uh, progressively it was uh, it was easy in the interest rate component uh, with the increasing inflation and some further declines in nominal interest rates while the exchange rate in real terms more or less moved back to equilibrium or became only slightly undervalued. Now the exit is about normalizing monetary policy, about, uh, about bringing it from expansionary to neutral. This is a a uh, backward look at uh, the output gap, a measure how the economy is using its capacity because the secondary objective of monetary policy is to st help stabilizing economy close to its potential. And here, if you look at it uh, from, 
from the backward exposed perspective, you can see that the negative output gap closed uh, pretty much in line with the expectations, which is another suggestion that uh, the policy has delivered on the secondary objective of monetary policy. Uh, of course, this is just a very naive comparison of what was ex expected and, and what happened. A kind of rigorous academic assessment requires you to, to simulate uh, counterfactual scenarios of what would have happened, all other things being equal without a policy. Uh, here I borrowed uh, a summary table from a forthcoming paper for, of two colleagues of mine from the Czech National Bank, Jan Bruha and Jaromir Toner. Uh, we are going to soon publish it as a CNB working paper. And in this uh, uh, paper, they used a combination of a structural DSG approach and purely data-driven approach based on the synthetic control method to evaluate the impact, and I'm not going. And also, they compare their own results with other studies, one one by IMF, and some independent academic studies. And it's it's not my purpose to go uh, through each cell of uh, the table, but uh, you can have a look at it uh, afterwards, and you can see that according to the estimates, there was a positive impact of uh, the floor on inflation, which is the primary objective of monetary policy, as well as on economic growth. The individual as end in terms of lowering unemployment. The individual estimates uh, differ in terms of their size. Uh, in in terms of the timing, was the impact bigger in 2014 or in 2015? And it's also fair to admit that they, uh, they differ in the degree of statistical significance. Not all of them are statistically significant, but overall, if you look at the picture, uh, it uh, seems that uh, the policy was really effective. And that's it. Uh, let me conclude. Uh, as I wanted to show, there are more differences than similarities between the Swiss and Czech case. We believe that the transparency about exit has paid off in our case because the uh, market has prepared for the exit and subsequently we haven't experienced any shocks uh, to the market and, and to the real economy related to jump appreciation of the currency. Uh, our assessment is such that uh, the Czech exchange rate uh, floor delivered the desired easing of monetary conditions, thus helped us to avoid deflation and to return inflation back to our 2% inflation target, even though we must admit that this return to the target uh, was much more delayed than what we originally anticipated, mainly due to uh, external uh, deflationary forces. And it also helped the, econom uh, the Czech economy to go back to its uh, potential, to its, uh, to its full capacity utilization. And hopefully, in our case, uh, the Czech exit is the first step towards normalizing the monetary conditions. We hope that we will not get stuck in a Swiss-style situation in which rates are still negative and interventions are on ongoing. Quite on the contrary, sooner or later we would like to move to positive nominal interest rates and, and go back to the standard inflation targeting framework with nominal interest rates being used as the main monetary policy instrument, which was also actually one of the objectives of the policy when the floor was being introduced, when it was being introduced. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, that's it from my side. So we'll have Jaromir Hornik now to give his presentation. Okay. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Once again. I would also first say that I'm very delighted that I can be here today. And uh, I must say, the first thing I have to say is that at the time when the exchange rate commitment was introduced at the Czech National Bank, I was there with the bank. So I cannot deny some sort of positive relationship to this, to this, to this framework. So uh, I'm, I have to disappoint those who expect that I would criticize the CNB for doing so. Uh, 
heavily. I was at that time in between my two IMF positions for 10 months as an advisor to the vice governor. So uh, I would start my, my comments by saying that the, the theory which is behind, behind the, the exchange rate commitment, I don't know what, what the Swiss National Bank experts were thinking when they were designing the floor, but when we were designing it, and I was part of that, we, the, the, I would say the motivation or the inspiration came from Lars Svensson, famous, at least on my side, uh, famous paper on uh, using exchange rate as a so-called foolproof way to escape a uh, uh, disinflationary period. And uh, this foolproof way is based on the idea that you move the level of the exchange rate towards the depreciation side and you keep it there as long as the price level, as long as you reach a price level that is consistent with that depreciated exchange rate. It's based on very simple mechanism I would say monetary theory of the exchange rate that basically says that stock of money, price level, and level of exchange rate is in principle one variable in the in the economy. So Lars Svensson came out with the idea that if you have an exchange rate 25, you move it to 27, which is what roughly the CNB did, and then you just keep waiting until you reach the price level that is equivalent to the to the moved exchange rate. So. There is one thing, though, which is very important. The Svensson foolproof way assumes that at least for the transitory period, the central bank basically switches the regime from inflation targeting towards a price level targeting. And then once you reach the, 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 the optimal price level or the adequate price level, you, you switch back to inflation targeting. And only then, only then basically it's not rational to expect any appreciation of the exchange rate after, after, after you exit the, the, the framework. So that's, that's sort of the, the motivation or inspiration which was behind, but not, it was not fully adopted when the Czech National Bank uh, basically went for the, for, the, for the exchange rate commitment because the Czech National Bank a little bit deviated from that saying, at least that's my understanding, that they see the exchange rate floor only as an additional tool within the inflation targeting uh, framework. So they never sort of completely internal in, so sort of like adopted the idea that there would be at least a transitionary period of uh, price level targeting. Having said that, and Tomas made me a great introduction, there is no doubt that the exchange rate commitment worked. There is, there is no doubt about it. What you see in the graph is exactly a counterfactual simulation using a New Keynesian model of, the, of, uh, of a Czech, Czech economy where I basically return back to the end of 2013 and I run the, the forecast once again or I simulate what would happen in the economy knowing everything about external, external development, so basically using what really happened in the Eurozone and with oil prices and with, uh, with the food prices, and having only interest rate at my disposal as a monetary policy tool. So in principle, this is the, the black line is what happened, right, with inflation and with the exchange rate, and, uh, and the dotted line is what would happen if the CNB did nothing with the exchange rate and kept only the, the interest, rate, interest rate at the zero level. So you see that the inflation would go of course, it's model-dependent result. It's not, you, you should not take it for granted, and I didn't have that much time to prepare, to pre prepare the, the, all the simulations 100% correctly, but it shows that the inflation would be definitely very negative for extended, for extended period of time, and the exchange rate would be much more appreciated that, than it is right now. And of course, you can imagine that the GDP growth would be much lower than, than it actually is, and the output gap would be much more negative. However, and I'm a big advocate of price level targeting, if the CNB did it in line with Svensson recommendations fully, so there would be a commitment to the, to the, to the price level targeting, at least for this transitionary period, the situation would be by, by far better than, than it actually is. Because if there was a price level commitment for a transitionary period, the, the inflation would look like the red dotted line having the same trajectory of the exchange rate. So 
I did the exchange rate trajectory on purpose the same, but what changes inside is that the central bank basically uses a completely different monetary policy framework for a transitionary period, which changes the rules of the game, changes uh, households and firms' expectations about future, future, future evolution of inflation and other macroeconomic variables, and then, of course, it changes also, also, also the outcome. So my argument is, okay, good job, Czech National Bank, you did well when you decided for the, for the exchange rate commitment, but a little change in the, in the monetary policy framework would basically serve us, serve us uh, as a country much better. But what is also quite important uh, fact is that if the central bank, if the CNB really adopted price level targeting for a while, the expected appreciation uh, of the exchange rate would be much less severe than it actually was. This is, of course, something which is, which is an, just a simulation. But what you see here is what a uh, market participant, if, he, if the market participant, an investor, financial market participant, was relatively well-educated and rationally expecting entity, knowing how the economy works, expects, would expect about the exchange rate at the end of 2013, knowing exactly what would happen with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the exchange rate and the rest of the world. So if I'm somewhere in 2014 and I understand what the Czech National Bank is doing and I, I believe that they will keep the exchange rate commitment till first quarter of 2017 and I know what's going to happen with the rest of the world, if there is a price level targeting, my expectation about the exchange rate appreciation after the exit is something about 25.50. My expectation about the exchange rate appreciation after the exit, after the exit with, uh, with what CNB really did is 23.50, right? Now, the thing is, this is about expectation. This is nothing about the reality. This is about what you expect years before the exit really happens, right? And if you have this expectation, of course, if you have a, your rational expectation that the exchange rate is going to appreciate after the exit, you simply, you simply do something, right? And that something is, of course, manifested in the, in the, in the exponential increase in the, in, the, in the balance sheet of the Czech National Bank. So obviously the exchange rate didn't appreciate to 23.50, right? That's, we see it, right? But there are costs. Right. why it didn't happen. And the cost we see in the balance sheet of the, of the central bank. So basically the fact that the, the central bank, that the inflow, the inflow of, the, of the money and the, and the accumulation of the, result, of the reserves is basically the manifestation of the, of the expectation of the future, future, future appreciation. Given, I mean, that, that expectation is formed, of course, in a, in a, in a past. Basically, it's, it's a very simple thing. We, we spoke about it with Thomas many times when we still work at the CNB. UIP equation, the uncovered interest rate parity, holds ex ante. It's an it's a equation that holds ex ante. It's about expectations. It doesn't have to hold ex post, of course, which is exactly what we, what we see in the data. So, so my conclusion is that exchange rate commitment was, in principle, working. Right? The, economy, the economy is better than it would be without it. But unfortunately, it could have been done better. We would have been a little bit higher in terms of uh, GDP growth and lower, lower or less negative output gap. But mainly, and that's my strong belief, the CNB would end up and exit the exchange rate commitment with much lower balance sheet in terms of accumulation of or much, much less need to, to buy the foreign, the foreign currency in their reserves. And in the end, we will pay for it, of course, as, as a society, for the way it has been done, because the, the, the CNB will create the losses on those bought foreign, foreign, foreign exchange reserves in the future, because there is, there is, of course, expectation of future appreciation thanks to the convergence, right? Economic convergence. And we can expect the cumulative appreciation of the exchange rate 
somewhere between 20 or 30 percent on the way to, to reach the GDP per capita of Germany. Just sort of a rule of thumb calculation given where we are and where the Germans, when the Germans are. And uh, that will, of course, create a loss. I mean, you can easily say it's just a counting thing, right? The money is not really missing. But if the loss it wouldn't be there, then uh, the CNB would, of course, pay a lot of seniorage to the government budget in the, in the next 10 or 15 years. But it will not, because the, 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 the profits will be used to, to cover the loss of the, that is created on the, on the, on the foreign exchange reserves. Um, so that's, 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 that's my comment to the, to the way of the exchange rate commitment or use of exchange rate commitment in, the, in here. And I, I would have one comment on the, using the opportunity of being the last speaker to comment on the Swiss case. I mean, seeing the presentation, it's a little bit to me, and it's also a question immediately for, for Professor Baketa. I guess a lot of the problem of the, in the Swiss case is that there is no firm nominal commitment in the future in Swiss in Switzerland, right? Because, because you see that you are in the, in, the, in the loop of more and more currency going in, and, uh, and that's forced, that is basically driven by the fact that there is expectation for, for further and further appreciation of, of franc, and the Swiss National Bank is somehow not able to, to break down these expectations, right? Maybe, 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 I don't know if there are consideration of that to, to publicly declare some or commit to some higher inflation in the future. For instance, say that the, that the Swiss will, 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 will bring inflation the next 15 years to 5% or something similar, which, <laughs> which, which according to the, to the theory should of course break the expectation of the, of, the, of the appreciation trajectory and eventually help to get out of the, of, the, of, the, of the loop. Because right now it seems to me that the Swiss National Bank is in some sort of loop of appreciation simply pushing for further appreciation and further inflow and uh, it's not really easy to see the way out of it. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, so I'll just make a few comments also in the form maybe of questions so we can start the discussion and then we'll open it up for a view. Maybe we'll give uh, Philippe uh, first chance to, uh, to address the other two presentations. Um, so, so one thing that's, that's really interesting here has been mentioned by a number of speakers is, is the cost to the country, to the society, right? And, uh, and I think that uh, a fair way to look at these policies in assessing them is what's the cost-benefit? In other words, have you guys internally done benefit-cost analyses or independent academics? And if so, which way is it coming out? Right? That's, that's, I think, very important. The other thing which is interesting, I think particularly in the Czech case, and what hasn't been mentioned here because these policies were not geared towards it, but in many, if not most, cases of um, uh, interventions in the exchange rate that we see around the world, it's part of a what used to be called industrial policy and is now usually called the competitiveness policy of a country. Right? You're trying to stimulate uh, exports, help uh, import substituting producers, and speed up economic growth. And in fact, uh, the interesting thing is when you talk to many of the people who followed uh, the Czech case in particular, they were saying, but look, that was just uh, competitiveness policy because it was the only country in the region that was going through the second recession. Uh, the country badly needed stimulus. Right? Germany, Austria, Poland, Slovakia were all growing. They didn't go into the second round of recession. So that was very smart. They were doing competitiveness policy. Right? Now, of course, the way the Czech National Bank presents it, that's not what they were uh, after, or at least they say that they weren't after. But uh, as uh, Tomáš indicated, in fact, the effect was exactly there. Uh, economic growth was stimulated as a result. It was, uh, country was growing faster. And so the question is to what extent really uh, uh, this was a form of um, implicit, hidden, whatever you want to call it, uh, pro-competitiveness policy as we see around the world in many instances historically. Um, the other thing that was mentioned quite a few times and probably deserves a little bit more of a uh, discussion is the level of interest rate, which went to zero in the Czech case and went to minus... Uh, 
0.75 in the Swiss case, and, uh, and obviously the Swiss have been very worried about it and still are. How far, how low can you go? Okay, and I think, Philippe, you can tell us a little bit more about it, but my sense is that the feeling is that the negative 0.75 is about the maximum. Uh, this is a very difficult subject because, you know, one has never been in that territory before, but you have some indirect things. For instance, the curious thing is that uh, apparently when after the tsunami in Fukushima, when they were uh, fixing the houses around there that were flooded, they found a lot of banknotes under the floor. So people started hoarding cash uh, as the Bank of Japan was lowering interest rates into the negative territory. And they didn't know about it. That was discovered totally accidentally. So it is an interesting question as to where, where one can go in, in this situation. And finally, I guess it would be interesting to speculate a little bit more uh, why, uh, if there was an asymmetric pressure on the Swiss authorities, the Swiss National Bank and the Czech uh, National Bank in terms of the speculators, uh, or if the pressure was felt in both cases perhaps differently, and, uh, and whether in fact uh, the 1,200 plus days indeed is some uh, form of uh, pressure that uh, is hard to resist uh, after a while in terms of the speculatory uh, attacks, which were not attacks in the traditional sense here, but pressures were, were mounting. So let me st stop here. Let's uh, have Philip do a response, and then we can open it up and everybody can come back. Okay, so uh, thanks. Uh, well, for, these, are, these were uh, quite interesting uh, uh, comments, uh, quite, quite useful uh, to learn about the, the, the Czech uh, experience. Um, but maybe uh, first let me uh, go back to the Swiss case because there were two questions related to that and then I, I make a broader, a, a broader comment. So first about the negative interest rate, whether this is uh, the lowest uh, level at minus 0 0.075, we don't know for sure. In the case of Switzerland, there is one specific aspect which is that this negative interest rate is not yet affecting uh, households. So depositors uh, they can still deposit uh, money at the bank at zero interest rate. And actually, even the banks that have money at the Swiss National Bank, a part of their reserves uh, uh, does not have this negative uh, interest rate. So it's only for the additional money or for uh, other financial intermediaries. Uh, so this may, uh, well, this hurts some financial intermediaries, but, but not, not all. And because of that, we are not totally sure. The Swiss National Bank says it can go lower because uh, this may, as long as you don't touch the households, then you will not have the bank notes uh, under the mattress. You can keep your money at, at, at the bank. And this is uh, uh, where, well, we, we don't know for, for sure much lower. We, 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 we cannot. Maybe we can uh, discuss this later. Uh, the, the second question was about the nominal commitment. Uh, and th this is actually, I found, a very good point. And the answer is that no, there is no nominal commitment. After they uh, gave up the fixed exchange rate on January 15, they said nothing, zero. So the, the, uh, the, the, either the governor or all these people talking, they said n nothing about the future policy. And before introducing uh, the, uh, the, the, the floor, they said zero, nothing. And so, and, and I think, well, so this is my, one of my criticism to, uh, the, to policy. There, uh, so the question is, is it a communication problem that they have a hard time trying to transmit? Or is it that they are so risk averse they don't want to say anything because they may say it wrong? Uh, I, I don't know, but this is really, really, really strange. And, and I, I'm, I'm convinced that this could help uh, forming expectations uh, about the future. So uh, the fact there is no nom nominal anchor, I think at least they could try to, uh, to influence expectations and, and have a better, a better communication. And this is, this is just not done. And for reasons that I don't uh, fully, fully understand. But then, so th this was my, the answer to my, to my question. Uh, now, but then I'd like to go to the Czech case and this is a bit related to that, to that point. Because as I understand your description, uh, the difference between the, the Czech case and the Swiss case, the Swiss case, this was really about this large capital inflow that, uh, uh, that were like 
uh, uh, influencing the, uh, the economic activity. The Czech case, basically, you wanted to have a, a, um, like an expansionary policy. You want to, to, to fight a, a, a deflation. And you decided to do this by having a floor on the exchange rate. And then you could have done even better by having a, a price level uh, targeting. But then the question is that could you have done it without fixing the exchange rate? So you could have uh, this nominal anchor, price level targeting, expansionary uh, well, buying reserves, and announcing all this communication. So to what extent is the, the floor itself uh, uh, important? And I guess, uh, so maybe Svensson, so in theory, well, in simple models, it makes no difference. In more complex models, uh, no, you, so have you, maybe have you thought about this? Why does this exchange rate uh, floor make a, a difference on top of uh, uh, announcing that you want to fight inflation, that you will have an expansionary policy, that you uh, everything else? So that, that's a question that uh, I'm, I would be uh, curious to know to know your answer. Maybe uh, I think it's uh, very important to realize that the price level targeting is theoretically very effective policy as long as people are rational and as, as long as they believe you. And I think the exchange rate de depreciation plays a very important role in the Swenson suggestion in the sense that there is a market in which you can really deliver an action which is visible to the general public, something that everyone understands, and it's a market where you can operate in unlimited amounts. So, in principle, doing it without the exchange rate commitment, if everyone understands what price level targeting is and everyone is f fully forward-looking rational agent, there wouldn't be any difference. But uh, if, you, if you have a kind of commitment problem and you're facing people that don't understand what price level targeting is, then of course showing the action in the FX market becomes very important. But there is also a danger in this because you run the risk of committing to two nominal variables, which uh, actually in the Swenson's paper it's solved by assumption, at least in the main body of the paper, because uh, he assumes that uh, foreign price level is more or less deterministic and uh, the real equilibrium exchange rate does not change. And then you can simultaneously control the nominal exchange rate and the uh, domestic price level without running into inconsistencies. Because the paper in the main body deals with the situation in which one small open economy is at the edge of deflation and the rest of the world is doing fine. But this is obviously not the situation that we were living through in uh, the preceding years. The euro area price level deviated very significantly from what was expected when we were introducing the floor. I actually have a back backup slide if I may show it. So uh, we use uh, producer price index in uh, trade weighted euro area to approximate foreign price level in our forecasting model. And in the right hand chart, uh, you can see what evolution of the price index for foreign producer prices was assumed uh, when we were introducing uh, the exchange rate floor uh, in the last inflation report in 2013. And in the brown color, you have the, the exposed outcome. 
And on the left hand chart, you can see that quite naturally the domestic price level pass in terms of the domestic CPI index is also much lower. And in this case, you, you are of course left with a dilemma. Is, is my commitment in terms of the price level? Then we, we would need to push the, the nominal exchange rate to much weaker levels. Not just 27, but maybe 30, 35. It, this way it would have worked, but, but the exchange rate would have to be a very flexible tool. On the other hand, if you want to commit to a certain nominal exchange rate level temporarily, you need to go to, to, to let the domestic price level go if the foreign price level goes. And actually to do justice to Swenson, he has an appendix uh, which discusses and analyzes this in his paper, but we know that hardly anyone reads appendices, uh, but I think this appendix, appendix is actually very important for understanding his proposals. I would just like to maybe add one thing. It's uh, you know I don't want to get in with too much into the discussion about the appendix in Swenson, but I, I, I still I still think that the or I'm of, I believe is that the 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 price level targeting commitment under Swenson full proof way is not absolute price level targeting like that. You really commit to the constant you know the the, the blue line in your slide. It's it's a commitment to the price level that is consistent with the with your exchange rate. Uh, commitment and whatever happens with the uh, with the real equilibrium exchange rate and then and uh, and the foreign price level the important thing is that if you have any sort of price level commitment you always compensate the under and overshooting and that what makes the trick right that you you simply you simply increase the inflation expectations if your inflation is below that uh, implicit price level target but we don't need to really go into that in that discussion i just uh, because Tomas answered answered the the question completely about the about the fact that uh, you you can you can of course say to the public that you would like to have a inflation you commit yourself to the inflation of five percent in the future but without an actual action which is the exchange rate is the way to to to, to see it uh, it is very is very difficult but I would also comment uh, want want to uh, comment on what the, what Mr. Schweiner said about the about the intention to 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 gain on competitiveness, or so what, it, what was it at the beginning? Was that, was there some sort of tendency to gain competitiveness, or was it about nominal values? And I can say just for myself, when I was preparing my background materials for the board at that time, I personally didn't think about the competitiveness a second. In my in my in my mind, it was always about moving the inflation up and get and basically avoid the risk of having uh, deflation in the country because it was all about, all my thinking was about avoiding uh, the real value of debt growing, which is, which is, just go back to Fisher and, and, and all the monetary economics, right, about what the monetary policy should do is stabilize the real value of debt. That's basically the, that's basically the thing. And with the deflation in the country, you of course can end up in, this, in, the, in the loop of increasing real value of debt. So, so I personally wasn't thinking a, a second about competitiveness. It was all about just get inflation up. But the interesting thing is that this is a situation where actually the policy went positively in both directions. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, right? sure. And by stimulating production, you reduce the real value of debt. Yeah. Right? Because the denominator grows. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's how countries got out of huge indebtedness. The US was indebted like crazy after mm -hmm. World War II. Debt did not shrink. GDP grew dramatically, right, over the next two decades. Yeah. I think we're ready for you guys. You can raise your hands, and uh, we will have the microphone coming around the room. You're free to ask questions relating to the presentations or other questions uh, that you always wanted to ask. Okay, yes, please. Okay, uh, Jiří Vidzany, uh, University of Economics, Prague. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, effects losses or, in fact, the cost-benefit uh, analysis, but the question was formulated by Professor Schweiner, but I don't think it was uh, answered. Uh, I have a related question. Uh, I would like to ask Professor uh, Bucket about uh, the size uh, of the effects uh, reserves. Uh, 
Uh, at the moment, uh, the Swiss uh, reserves are above 100% uh, uh, GDP of the central bank, uh, uh, which means that uh, the profit loss of the central bank is quite sensitive to movements uh, of the exchange rate, uh, say 5% movement, uh, which is quite normal on an annual basis, is translated to 5% uh, uh, GDP impact uh, on the profit loss uh, of the central bank, which uh, probably is not uh, sustainable in the long term. So, uh, do you see any way out of the situation, or do you think there is any limit on on the size uh, of the FX reserves that are still going up? Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll answer about this reserve. The cost-benefit analysis, maybe I'll, I'll let somebody... <laughs> uh, no, so the, well, the, I mean, it's not clear what the size, uh, the, the limit on reserves. Uh, is, so you are right that it's very sensitive to exchange rate movements, but uh, contrarily to the uh, uh, earlier period, now we st tend to believe that the Swiss franc is slightly uh, uh, overvalued, or it's overvalued by you know, more than slightly, 15, 20 percent. So according to uh, well, most, most models, uh, uh, the Swiss franc is more likely to, to depreciate, uh, plus the Swiss uh, returns are lower than foreign returns. So on, on average, in the next, say, 20 years, uh, it's more likely that the, the, the Swiss National Bank will make a, a profit, and actually a, a huge profit. Um, now, uh, well, plus they also now invest in, uh, in, in stock price, in stocks. So equity shares, uh, I mean, they are doing uh, relatively well, so they're making a, a nice, nice profits. Um, now, whether they can live, uh, how long can they live with these reserves? As long as we are in a, in a liquidity trap. Because basically these reserves, they come uh, from uh, the banks, and the, uh, the banks, they basically get the, these deposits. Uh, so it's just that people don't, don't want to spend or put their money somewhere else. So as long as people are happy to have uh, uh, their money in the, the, the Swiss banks, uh, that uh, will be uh, sust sustainable, uh, thanks to the, the level of the exchange rate. Once you get out of the liquidity trap, people will start to invest elsewhere, so that this balance sheet will have to be to be reduced. Uh, yeah, so, so that's um, so there is a, there is a risk on a year to year basis. It can be fluctuations, losses. When they have losses, they don't distribute profits. When they have benefits, they can distribute high, higher higher profits. But my my view, and according to most analysis, international finance analysis, is that the investment in uh, foreign assets will give a higher return than uh, the liabilities in Swiss francs, which is either zero interest rate or even some is negative interest rates. So it's a nice, actually it's a nice operation for, uh, 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 like a, as a financial intermediary, you can leverage and uh, you, have a, you have a risk, but on, you, you have to expect that if we, if we don't have a financial crisis in the next 10, 20 years, it's a big profit for the, for the Swiss people. If I may continue on, on this with the check case, I have two more uh, backup slides. <laughs> Actually, this exchange rate commitment... Uh, You're like a magician, you pull out be, rabbits. Yeah. No, it taught us to be forward-looking in monetary policy area, not just in terms of uh, the decision-making, focusing on future inflation, but also in terms of communication. We learned that it's too late to answer questions once they come. We need to anticipate the questions that would be coming and prepare well in advance. So if, if I made the control uh, or, or that uh, remote control, I, 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 can, uh, I can go to it. Uh, okay. So this is the, the historical look at the CNB's equity, both in uh, billions of Czech Karuna and relative to the GDP. And you can see that so far, uh, the policy has been profitable. I, I'm not saying it's going to stay profitable in the future, but we started with negative equity of about uh, minus 100 billion, and now we have positive equity of more than 50 billion. So any losses in the future, the first 150 billion karunas would be just going back where we were when we started. And secondly, I think the potential for future losses is somewhat exaggerated uh, because 
uh, it uh, assumes that uh, the yields on our uh, FX reserves will be relatively low. Uh, we did some simulation models together with uh, Jarek Hurnik and Martin Sensibuch in the past, and in, in that, in those models, we actually assumed a very conservative investment strategy on uh, the part of the central bank approximating the yields on reserves with, I think, three months Euribor. But if you look at the actual track record of the CNB in terms of managing its reserves, the yields on reserves in foreign currencies over the last uh, decade have been two percentage points higher than the sterilization cost that we pay to the domestic banks uh, on uh, the repo facility. And if this continues, it, it may consume a large part or offset a large part of any exchange rate appreciation losses. And actually in our forecast, we assume that the medium term potential of Corona is to appreciate by 1.5% a year or something like that, 1 to 2%, which would be consistent with the Czech economy, let's say, growing at 3% and the Euro area economy growing at slightly less than 2%. So if we look at it from a long-term perspective, we are in less advantageous position than Switzerland. It's not such a money-making machine potentially because we have this long-term appreciation trend which is not present in Switzerland. But still, if the appreciation trend is not too fast, it can be offset to a large extent by the positive uh, yield differential. like to comment on, on this on this loss only one thing there is very simple it, it, it of course it looks when you check Tomas's graph it looks fine that the central bank was able to get from those negative losses and then that will be negative and then it will get again out of it but it, but the problem is that the CNB has never ever paid any profit to the government right and in terms of central banks it's it's simply it's simply not common I mean central banks normally are I mean, central banking is very profitable business, right? Printing money simply should, on average, deliver something, and, we, and CNB hasn't ever delivered anything, right? So you, you want should think about, about what would happen if the balance sheet wasn't like that, right? That's, that's simply my, my point. And I have one, just one funny provocative question to, to, to comment on Swiss, on Swiss case. You, you say that the exchange rate, that the exchange rate is overvalued by, let's say, 15%, but when you... Th talk about overvaluation, it's about the real exchange rate overvaluation, right? Nominal exchange rate can be anything. So, so then, then it's only your assumption eventually that the, that the overvaluation of the real exchange rate will be, will be basically uh, compensated by depreciation in the nominal, but it can also be compensated by the deflation in Switzerland for the next 15 years. So then, of course, you would, net, you would not get from the spiral of of appreciation, deflation, further appreciation, further, further, further deflation, which brings us back to the missing nominal anchor, of course. Yeah. All right, do we have any uh, other questions? Yes, thank you. It doesn't matter. It will work without microphone as well. She may not see Yes, okay. I would just like to make two remarks as um, Swiss ambassador in what he said um, uh, for um, the households and um, uh, also the role of the National Bank. The first one is we do have a lot of pension funds which have enormous amount of money and they are bound by some uh, law to invest to a certain extent in Switzerland which explains maybe part of our real estate uh, market. And these bonds, they don't have negative interest rates so far neither. And I think that's an important point. And the second one, our National Bank, as he explained, was and is highly profitable and that is very relevant for a federalist country like we are. Because all the cantons, according to a quite uh, different scheme, uh, but they get a certain percentage of part of the profits of the National Bank. And for smaller cantons, this is a very important, let's say, Christmas gift which they get every year and which makes part of their financial planning and of their possibilities to invest. 
So for us in Switzerland, we follow for obvious reasons, but also for reasons of the households, very interested what our national bank is doing, because there is a lot of relation also for the citizens and in our federalistic state. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's an important statement. I think in the United States, the uh, Fed maybe with recent exceptions, uh, always transfers money to the Treasury. Very significant. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Yep, Michal Keak. My name is Michal Keak. I'm from Sergi. I, I would have uh, one comment and one maybe question. Uh, the comment is I would like to broaden the picture a little in the way that uh, we always, if we want to analyze the, the effects of the policies, we should always look into fiscal mix of the fiscal and monetary policies, right? And I think that uh, understandably it was not mentioned here. I think at the time when, when this uh, devaluation or depreciation of the crown uh, happening, was happening, uh, it was the time when we were in a, in a recession and before, uh, briefly before we were the only, I think the only country in the Europe who was in a recession. So I think that it was a very good uh, move from the Czech National Bank to to start to do because I think that it was not a long time before or maybe it was the first time when Czech National Bank started to talk about this, uh, about the uh, role in stabilizing output because I think it was not heard before. Original was like just uh, price stability and then, uh, then a stable financial sector. So I think it was, it was a good one. It could be maybe a little, a little sooner than, uh, than was happening. But at the end, I think it was it was very uh, it was very good uh, very good uh, exercise and was very very well done. And uh, I think that uh, second uh, uh, second question or second uh, second comment would be that when we are talking about the growth effects of these things, it also depends on this fiscal on this fiscal policy. So I would be uh, I would be wondering how you. Um, how you disentangle this, the effect of, of the monetary policy, uh, because you are of course taking the, the fiscal policy and this was a big change in the, in the fiscal policy and all, all, other, all other aspects of that. Maybe that Tomáš Holubet already some backlog slides for that. <laughs> These two. <laughs> no, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't have uh, backup slides because uh, it's the work of someone else and I don't want to to show it fully before it gets published. But I think it's partly, at least partly done in the DSG models, the core forecasting model G3 and the version by Toner and others 2015 by the fact that we use the model including the history, which is of course affected by the fiscal shocks. Uh, we filter the structural shocks within those models and then when doing the counterfactual scenario we keep those shocks in the model and we just take the exchange rate shocks uh, take out the exchange rate shocks associated uh, with uh, the exchange rate commitment in the synthetic control method uh, if i'm not mistaken it's not done explicitly you do it only implicitly by comparing yourself to a set of similar countries in the eu i, I if i remember well from the defense of the paper the, the main value is uh, german uh, the main weight are put on germany hungary poland and uh, those countries also went to similar waves of fiscal policy. They, they had a fiscal expansion in the post-Lehman phase because it was coordinated by the European Commission. Then they started to consolidate to a various degree. Slovakia is there as well. And uh, then once the consolidation started to bear fruit, they, they could relax a little bit and they actually had a common cycle of EU funds, which, which are now very important for the fiscal shocks. Uh, the EU fund cycle has become a more important source of fiscal shocks for the Czech economy than the domestic fiscal policy uh, in, in recent years. And the same is true about the Slovak, Polish, Hungarian economy, which are part of the control group that you're using. So it's not 100% there, but I believe that at least to some, some uh, extent, yes. Maybe I just want to say a word just for information about fiscal policy in Switzerland. This was not mentioned in the picture. 
uh, because uh, probably we don't want to talk about this because it's a bit uh, depressing. Uh, now, so it was a period where we entered a recession and we should have helped uh, uh, monetary policy and exchange rate policy with expansionary uh, fiscal policy. Instead, uh, the uh, gov uh, federal government debt was reduced from 50 to 35% of GDP. So this was a, a, a period where uh, fiscal policy should have helped by being expansionary, and instead it was more contractionary than the than, than than usual. So this was just went to reverse, and this makes life more difficult uh, for the central bank, for monetary policy, and for the exchange rate uh, policy, because uh, the debt becomes even more, more desirable, and then there's less, less, you reduce the supply of, of, of Swiss debt, which is in so much demand. This, this was completely uh, non, uh, well, totally irrational macroeconomic uh, policy, so just to complement the, the, the picture. So that's a very interesting point because the, uh, uh, the stylized facts are that advanced economies pursue counter-cyclical policies. The developing countries that don't have the resources do pro-cyclical. So Switzerland temporarily switched from developed to a developing economy in its fiscal policy. So on that note, let's thank uh, the speaker, the panelists. Um, why don't we give them a round of applause? And uh, let me also uh, thank the Swiss Embassy, IDEA Think Tank here. You can see the studies outside. There are a lot of policy-oriented studies. Daniel Munich, who is standing in the background here, can give you more information about it. And of course, the Academy of Sciences with its strategy AV21. And I understand the Swiss ambassador, in fact, is uh, going to invite us now. Is that true? Please tell us what, you're, what you have for us. <laughs> Uh, you have the usual things. Microphone. And uh, you're going to have Swiss wine. Just and you're going to have a nice cocktail. Just behind there. And I need a little bit of wine. Just to uh, stomach the fact that we are retrograded to a developing country. <laughs> we are among friends. Let's enjoy the cocktail. Please. Thank you.